any questions, please type them in the chat box. There will also be a, a section at the at the end where we will answer questions. Um, if there's any complex questions, uh, we'll leave these to the end and either John or myself will, will answer them. Um, now, we want you to know that even if you plan to leave early, you can still do a lot to protect your home and increase its chances of survival, such as reducing the flame and heat near your house and reducing the risk of embers setting fire to your house. Now, just before I go on to my next slide, I've just got a question for you and you can put those into the chat box. Uh, two questions, actually. Just your postcode so we can get an idea of where you're from and what type of property you reside on. So whether you're on a residential block, whether you're on a couple of acres. So if you just pop that into the chat. Now, I would just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are gathered and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Now, tonight, what you will learn is, is my property at risk? how fires destroy buildings, how to prepare your property, what you can do, spring, a little bit about sprinklers and landscaping and garden design for your property and specific to you. And from that, I will hand over to John. Thanks, uh, pardon me, thanks Tamara and uh, welcome everyone to uh, tonight's session on uh, preparing your property uh, for bushfire. Um, we're gonna start off with a, um, a short little video, um, which touches on a lot of the aspects that we're going to cover tonight on um, on preparing your property. So uh, thanks, Tamara, if you want to um, start that video. <clears throat> Before and during the fire season, it's important to prepare your property, whether you plan to leave early or stay and defend. If you're staying or it's too late to leave safely, a well-prepared property may reduce the risk to your personal safety. If you're leaving, there's a better chance your house will be there when you return. Mowing your lawn and clearing your gutters is a good start to property preparation, but there are many other simple things that you can do to improve the chances of your home surviving. And remember, maintenance throughout the fire season is key. Some of these jobs you can do before the fire season even begins. Prune back any branches that are overhanging or near the house that could break off and cause damage, allowing embers inside. Prune off branches that are less than two metres off the ground. Keep shrubs under trees short. This creates space, making it harder for the fire to travel up into the trees, which would result in a more intense fire. A wood pile is a handy thing to have next to your house during winter, but during summer, it's an ember trap. So move it away for the warmer months. There are a number of jobs to do repeatedly throughout the fire season. Try not to overwhelm yourselves by allowing tasks to accumulate for you to do at the last minute. Most of these tasks are about removing fine fuels that can catch fire if embers land on your property. Leaf buildup is perfect tinder for a fire, so periodically clearing leaves from your gutters is absolutely critical. Get rid of any dried grass, leaves or twigs from around your house and garden as these can trap embers and create fuel for the fire. Regularly mow and water your lawn to help slow a fire down. On hot, dry and windy days when there's a high risk of fire, there are some last minute jobs to be done. Houses have been known to catch fire from an ember landing on a doormat. So bring those doormats inside. And whilst you're at it, remove any other items that could catch fire, like dog beds, rubbish, or outdoor furniture on your decks or verandas. Wherever you see leaves accumulating around your home is generally where the wind will carry embers. Clean up leaf litter in corners and doorways to prevent embers starting a fire. Many of us are lucky enough to live in this beautiful Victorian landscape. Doing so comes with certain risks and responsibilities. Preparing your property before and during fire season is a small price to pay for this lifestyle and can help improve the chances of your house surviving a fire. What are you going to do to prepare for fire this season? Hey, uh, first of all, apologies if there was a little bit of a lag in that uh, video. Um, the storm outside's not actually 
helping the situation. Lots of um, ideas on um, that video that we're actually going to go through and, and cover um, as uh, through the course of the evening. Um, so we need to look at your property. Um, is your property at risk? Um, we're going to focus um, the beginning um, of this presentation to be on the back, um, your back deck mainly. So uh, thanks, Tam. Um, a lot of our decks, we've got outdoor furniture, the dog, kennel, the welcome mat, the front door. Um, if you have a look at, at, at the, the photos that are there, try to picture your, your back deck or your veranda or maybe the, the uh, uh, gazebo area, the barbecue area. Do you have furniture similar to this? Uh, um, and do we, how, oh, oh, sorry, why are these things considered to be um, a risk? Why are we listed though? Why do we put those photos up? Well, the cushions on the, on the furniture um, are going to be made of a synthetic material. The, the Koya mat is very, very flammable. You've got leaves that have gathered underneath the, um, uh, the cane chairs. There's lots of other ignition points, the dog's bed, right? the, the dog hair that's collected in the corner of the, of the building, right? those sorts of places. All right, next one, please, Tam. And then you're going to have a look at um, where are we right? Yeah. And so we've got in the um, the trees hang overhanging. The, are there leaves in your gutter? And if you live, you know, north of the highway in the Shire, um, yeah, you're definitely going to have that. There's no no question of, of the um, uh, leaves and and twigs and etc. In your gutter, in the valley of the uh, of the roof, and the, are the birds nesting in in your building? Because right? if a bird can get in and nest inside your um, roof cavity or underneath the building, there is no question an ember can go in because an ember only requires a space of about two millimeters. The the plinth boards, the barge boards underneath the deck. Uh, the vent, we require the vents to, to, to provide the ventilation underneath the building. Otherwise, we're going to get uh, wood rot. Um, there's going to be a little bit of a heat build up, makes it lovely for uh, for white ants. So that and underneath the deck, we need to have that, that ventilation. But those gaps are uh, enable that ember to go in. Going to create that problem for you. The the mulch in the top corner, right? it's it's a pine bark mulch or it's a wood chip. It's flammable. Right? It just requires embers to land on it, and then if those shrubs were, if we could imagine those shrubs in front of, uh, sorry, in front of those windows were were bigger, then they're going to impinge on the glass. So it creates a problem. Okay. Thanks, Sam. Now, Victoria is in one of the world's, it's a handful of countries and places around the world where we have, have an extreme fire risk. And Councillor Owen just mentioned it. We, we have areas, it's not just north of the, of the highway here in Cadinia Shire, all right, or out in those heavily forested areas of, let's say, the Bunyip State Park, et cetera. All areas of Victoria, are fire prone. Right? The cropping lands in the west right, are very, very fire prone. Right across to coastal scrub, right through South Gippsland, and across through the um, the Ballerine Peninsula and um, and along the, the coast there, the western coast there. Right? All of these places are fire prone. Yes, some of them. Are, are, are listed as extreme, if you like. Others are just down to that high or very high sort of category, if you like. But don't sort of kid yourself to say, oh no, it's my place is all cleared, because even open grasslands are a fire risk. All right. Thank you. So if we look at the vegetation, 
We've got in number four that open grassland. That will burn. There's no question of it. With a strong wind behind it, it will it will fair move along. Right across to number six, which is the coastal scrub. Uh, you might think, oh, coastal scrub, it's pretty sparse. It's not that thick. Not as thick as the forest that we have up here um, in in the north part, northern parts of the Cadenia Shire. Correct. But we've got parts of, of our shire that are on that coastal land end. You'll get to Turidan, Jan Jarrup, down there that way towards Lang Lang. So all of these places that, that heavily forested of number one and number two. And then you've got that urban interface in number three, right, that urban and rural interface where residents or um, residential properties are meeting those open grasslands or abut onto heavily forested lands. So, um, and then in number five, the different, we've got all the different types of vegetation. The, the different species that, that we grow. You know? and some of them have got that very fibrous bark, like the stringy bark. And then you've got the ones that are like that, like the similar to the ribbon gum. And then you've got other trees um, and shrubs that have got no bark at all. They're a very smooth trunk. So the vegetation um, that's on your property or abutting your property or nearby is a consideration that you need to take into account. Um, when preparing your property and thinking about, well, what, I, what do I have to do to better prepare my own property? Now, um, fires, there's, there's three ways that fires will destroy brick buildings. There's the direct fire flame uh, contact where flame impinges directly onto the building itself and ignites the, 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 the timber or the, the deck or whatever it might be. It might be caused because of a, a, a branch being blown in, some debris, right? some fire-laden uh, debris gets blown in, breaks a window, and, and then you've got the direct flame contact. And then you've got radiant heat will also um, ignite a building. Because the radiant heat, our bodies can only stand a certain amount of radiant heat, and and it's, it's, it's in the vicinity of about four kilowatts in our, our arms and our body starts to blister and fires, bushfires will produce a lot more, a hundred, a thousand kilowatts of, of, of energy. So it enables in that material to ignite. But the main reason that buildings just, uh, are destroyed by fire is because of embers. Embers, we have thousands, millions of embers before during and well after the fire front has gone through. So anything you can do to pre better prepare your property, even if you're not there, and that's that's what we would prefer, we would prefer that people have left and left early, right? but if you've prepared your property, it has a better chance of surviving. I'm not going to guarantee that it will survive, but it has a better chance. Your gutters have been cleaned out the lawns have been maintained. Right? You don't have the mulch against the, the, the building, the, the organic mulch that you've got in organic mulch. Right? So think about those sorts of things. So the, the embers are the main reason that, um, that houses um, and buildings will, um, will, will be destroyed because of fire. There's a, a, a quick little video. Um, that some people might find this a little bit distressing. Um, but um, yeah, thanks, Sam. During a bushfire, embers will reach your home long before the flames do. Ember attacks are the most common way that houses catch fire. Embers are burning leaves, twigs, and pieces of bark. They help the bushfire spread by starting spot fires ahead of the main fire front. Short distance ember attacks happen when leaves and small pieces of bark are blown from burning trees. The intense shower of sparks that forms fills the air with hot burning embers which will land on nearby vegetation and properties. The hot embers can easily land and get into your clothes and burn your skin, eyes and airways. 
small fires will start all around you and quickly become uncontrollable. The resulting chaos creates confusion as the fire seems to come from many directions, meaning it will be difficult to make good decisions about your safety. The experience will be physically exhausting and emotionally traumatic. Long distance ember attack is caused by large bushfires that generate intense heat. As the hot air rises, it forms a column of smoke that sucks in air like a vacuum, increasing the intensity of the fire. The updraft in the column lifts embers, like large pieces of burning ribbon bark, hundreds of meters into the air, where strong winds can carry them many kilometers beyond the fire front. On Black Saturday, embers traveled more than 30 kilometers ahead of the main fire. When these embers land, they often start fires where leaves naturally accumulate, like in gutters, doorways, and garden beds. So while you might think you're safe when a bushfire is far away, embers can fall from the sky and land around your home long before you even know there's a fire. But remember, your home isn't the only thing under threat during an ember attack. By the time you realize the danger, it might be too late as escape routes become jammed. Embers can also start fires on roads and block them completely, making late evacuation dangerous or impossible. That's why leaving early, before a fire starts, is always your safest option. All right, so a fire that starts um, well ahead or up in, say, the Hillsville area, can affect um, the northern parts of our shire through just through uh, embers and creating those spot fires um, ahead of it. Right. Tam, I think there's the uh, radiant heat. Um, we'll need to go back one slide. Victoria is one of the most bushfire prone parts of the world. Every summer, bushfires threaten properties and lives. But did you know it's not the flames that kill most bushfire victims? No, it's the radiant heat. Most victims die from the effects of radiant heat long before they're reached by the flames. Radiant heat is what you feel when you sit next to a campfire. If a campfire heats up to two kilowatts per square meter, you'll feel that it's too hot and will want to move back from the fire. If you don't, this amount of radiant heat is enough to cause burns and blisters in as little as 40 seconds. At 12 kilowatts, it can cause some materials like dry timber to ignite. A bushfire can reach 100 kilowatts and the effects can be truly catastrophic. For humans, radiant heat can cause burns from 100 meters away and cause a dangerous increase in body temperature. Radiant heat can cause the rapid onset of heat stroke. Heat stroke damages your brain, meaning you won't be able to concentrate to make good decisions as the fire arrives. Other impacts include severe damage of internal organs and death. There are some things you can do if you're caught in a fire. Cover your skin with long-sleeved natural fibre clothing, like wool. It's also useful to know that radiant heat only travels in straight lines and can't bend around corners. So, sheltering behind or inside solid structures may help protect you. But be aware, radiant heat will travel straight through glass. The best defense against radiant heat is a simple one. If you're not anywhere near a bushfire, it's radiant heat can't hurt you. Leaving early is always your safest option. Thanks, Tim. Um, so those, those two videos um, hopefully give you a bit of an idea that if you are caught, that's what you're going to, uh, going to occur. 
lots and lots of embers, high radiant heat. And as they said in the video, radiant heat is the biggest killer in, in a bushfire. So what we we'll want to do now is we want to look how we're going to prepare our property. What are the sort of things that we can, you can do to um, make, the, make your property um, a little bit more resistant to the issues that you may incur in a bushfire? The first thing you can do is having a look at the truck that's in the, um, the watermark there, can we get that through the gate, the front gate of your property? Uh, the trucks now are three and three plus metres wide, seven to eight metres long, uh, three, three and a half metres high. Can we drive in to your property and then once we get towards the, the, the house, can we turn around? Because if we can't turn around, we're then going to have to back in, which is going to take a lot longer. If you're on acreage, can we have can we get access through a gateway at the end of your driveway so that we can turn in a paddock? Because we need to look after ourselves as well and try to plan an escape route. So we need to know, can we get in? Uh, are the trees overhanging? We need to tri trim those back. We need to make sure that the gate um, is, is open. If you've left, one of the things that we recommend is that you leave the gate open so that we can access your property. And if the, if you've got electric gates, how can we access those? If the power is gone, it's best to, to leave those sorts of things open so that we can go through. Uh, so looking at parts of our building now, all right, and in that video, they talked about the windows being one of the weakest points in that the radiant heat will go through the glass. If um, windborne um, debris hits the glass, there is that chance it will crack or break and then allow the embers in or the, the burning piece of, the, of wood in or whatever it might be. So you can look at the ex explore the avenues of, of shutters. You can try to cover those windows with AC sheeting or corrugated iron. Obviously, it's not a last minute job. It's something that you need to have planned and have access to fairly quickly. The, the issue with putting down the shutters, if you put shutters in, how do they operate? Do they require electricity? Can, is there an override? Is there a manual override? They battery powered. Right? All of those sorts of things. The other issue that you have with shutters or boarding them up with AC sheeting or um, um, corrugated iron is the situational awareness. If if you are caught at your property, right, and, and, and we're, we're hoping that you're not, we're hoping that you've made that decision that I've prepared my body, a uh, 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 property, I've covered over the windows and I'm leaving. But if you are caught, you need to be able to still see where that fire is coming from. Right? So you need to be uh, cognizant of that sort of issue. But ideally, you've left early, you've sealed up the, 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 the glass, the, the windows, and you have left. Right? So um, you can go to the expense of, of toughened glass, et cetera, et cetera. And they're, they're things that you then need to explore. Right? I don't have those. Um, you know, whether toughened glass is going to, you know, be a cheaper option for you or not. All right. Thanks, Tam. Doors. Right. <clears throat> we talked earlier about the, the doormat being at the door. It's an ember trap. Anywhere there where it's that flammable material, like we talked about the um, the leaves congregating in the corner, gathering in the in the in the uh, in the valley and in the gutter, they're ember traps. So the core mat at the front door is a, is a, an ember trap. That piece of, of rotting um, timber, it's an ember trap. It enables an ember to go in. Remember, an ember requires only about two millimetres. Right? If you do have um, a weatherboard home, if the gaps between the, the door uh, jab and the door frame and the, and the weatherboards, right? again, we need to seal those off. 
with with some sort of chalking compound. Uh, the, ideally, your front door and your back door, any any doors to the outside, are solid doors and not cavity type doors. So cavity type door is just a ply board made of ply. Right? And and in some properties where it's sheltered, yeah, they've put a uh, a ply door in a cavity door. Ideally, the solid door is better because it will take longer for it to ignite. Right? And one of the last things you do when you as you as you leave is get that that uh, doormat, that coir mat or whatever it might be, um, even one of those rubber ones, because if they're, if they're the, um, the rubber mats that have got the large gaps in them, leaves can get in there. So get that mat and throw it either out onto the lawn as you, as you go out towards the car or put it into the, in the house. Right? So doors, you can do things around your, your, your doorway. The roof. Right? Now, if, you, if you've got access to your roof cavity, I really recommend that you go up and have a look. And I will guarantee in the majority of places you will find leaves. You will find grass stalks, bird feathers. You will find all of those things because the wind has blown them in. The birds have come in and made a nest. Now, if the wind has blown that leaf in, or the bird has got in there and created a, a nest, right? A two millimetre amber is definitely going to get in. Right? It's dry up there, extremely dry. So by having a look in that roof cavity, if you can see a feather, a gra some grass or even leaves, you know embers can come in. And so you need to think about, okay, how can I seal the roof area? So you can put in um, the metal um, gutter guards over the be underneath, say, the corrugated iron or underneath the tiles. So to stop the, the birds getting in from that way, it also enables the, the, um, the gutters not to fill with leaves. The, the, the metal um, gutter guard, far superior than the plastic uh, the one on the roll, far better. Uh, again, the gaps on that uh, mesh type um, gutter guard is around that two millimetre mark. So it, the ember might land on the gutter guard, but it then gets blown off. Right? So keep your, your gutters, it'll help you with keeping your gutters clean, but take that time to have a look up in your roof cavity. Another place that's um, extremely dry is underneath um, your home in the subfloor. Um, the the area underneath your floor for some in, on some properties becomes a dumping ground for bits of, of timber, for some old furniture, for bits and pieces. If you've got the space, I know people will still put things underneath there because it is dry. You know? Now, if it's open, obviously the leaves are going to get blown in. Right? You can have the rodents in there building nests. Right? creating havoc with, with some of your furniture. So how are you going to do that? And if you recall that photo with the, the deck and I talked about the, um, the plinth boards, the barge boards on the, on the, the side of the, uh, the deck, what you can do there from the inside, using a wire mesh or the um, steel fly, uh, uh, fly wire, not the fiberglass, not the plasticky type stuff, but the steel one, Putting that from the inside using a heavy duty staple gun, stapling that fly wire on the inside of the, the, the police boards underneath your house still enables the breeze to blow through, still enables that ventilation to, to continue underneath your home, but it prevents the majority, if not all, of your embers, of the embers from going in. The same with the vent. You know, you can pop the, the steel grate, the steel vent um, cover off, cover that with a, a, a mesh, or if you don't want to take that off, you can actually screw um, an aluminium uh, mesh, not, not a flywire mesh, but, a, but like a, a metal grate with the, the smaller holes, like the, the gutter guard type uh, material. 
So there are things that you can do. Right? If you wanted to, you could put um, AC sheeting, right? cement sheeting on the inside of those barge boards and just do that for the, the summer season. Right? And then so that's when, when the fire danger period is declared, right? one of your tasks in, in your fire plan is to put that AC sheeting up against the uh, on the inside of that of the deck, right? so that it prevents those embers from going in. Right? And then once the fire season is finished, that can come off. So the garage, your, your garage doors, the, the seals in good condition. The seal at the bottom of your garage is it? It's normally a, a rubber seal. Has that worn out? Has it been broken off? So if part of it is, is, if there's a piece of it missing, a leaf can get blown in. The, the roller door, as it goes up, will roll. There'll be a gap between the roller door and the, the top part of the, uh, the, the um, top part of the, uh, the door opening. So check that. Right? There's lots of things that you can do, like the carport. Yeah, okay, carport is basically just the roof. You know, but try not to then use the car, the carport as a, an area, a storage area for the extra furniture that you might have or the old wardrobe or for the, the couple of hay bales because it'll be right next to your house and and you might have two or three hay bales underneath the carport so that you can go and feed a biscuit of hay to the, to the horse. Those sorts of things. They all become ember traps, that hay bale even in, the, in a wheelbarrow because it's easier to, to bring it back up from the shed. The gas bottle, all of those sorts of things need to be moved from that area around your home. Okay. Um, next one is, oh, we're going to look at, uh, at sprinklers and you might think, yeah, okay, I've heard a lot about sprinklers, I've seen a lot um, on YouTube. And sprinklers looks like a, an option for me. Okay, there's lots of things you need to consider before you go down the path of sprinklers. First of all, you need to get expert advice. And by expert advice, I mean you need to go to a pump um, type place, an experienced plumber, someone who is really good about, well, sorry, with, uh, with hydraulics. Someone who will know how high your, your water head is. What type of sprinkler head are you going to put on that riser? Where are you going to position them? Where's my water supply coming from? If you're just on reticulated water, right, because you're on the, in, a, in a residential um, area, everyone, <clears throat> pardon me, everyone will be using that water. If, it, if there is a fire in the event of a fire. So you're going to lose a lot of your pressure. So if the plumber took the measurements on a normal day, yeah, you could put it up to a metre high and you could run this type of head. But on a day of 40 degrees, when everybody's using water to, to uh, wet down their, their lawns and, and garden beds, that water's not going, that, that sprinkler's not going to work. It's not going to have the efficiency. If you've got a, se a, a separate independent water supply, at a minimum, I'd, I'd be looking at a minimum of 20, 30,000 litres, depending how long that's going to uh, pump for. And you, that, again, you need to talk to a pump specialist. That pump, what's it going to run on? Is it an electric pump? You're going to lose power. Is it going to be petrol? Because in the event of, an, of, a, of a really difficult fire situation, it will vaporise. So how are you going to cover it? There's lots of things that you need to consider when you're looking at the, uh, at the avenue, of, of, if you're going to go down that avenue of sprinklers. As I said right at the beginning, get some expert advice from a really good a plumber that you can trust, someone who understands hydraulics, All right? those sorts of things. Okay. Thanks, Sam. Um, and then we look at your garden. So we've looked at the building, we've looked at the windows, the doorways, um, the, the, the deck area, the garage, etc. Looked at sprinklers. We're going to look at the, your garden. 
And <clears throat> obviously every plant, every piece of vegetation will burn. All right. Some will burn far easier than others. As a general rule of thumb, the finer the leaf, the finer the fuel, the easier it will burn. The, the thicker the leaf, the waxier the leaf, the more difficult it will be to ignite, but it will burn given the, the, the increase in temperatures, et cetera, and the radiant heat. Right? But there are things like the inorganic material, the stones, the pebbles, the concrete, the rocks, those sorts of things don't burn. Now, that style of garden doesn't necessarily suit everybody. Right? And that's, that's fair enough. Right? CFA does have um, uh, some materials and brochures and, and some books available um, online. <clears throat> Pardon me, if you search the CFA website for landscaping, it will give you some ideas right, about how firewise your garden might be. And it's obvious, the less vegetation equals the less uh, less fuel, which equals a safer property. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Sam. So changing from the pine mulch or the wood chips to a coloured stone or a coloured rock or that inorganic material will help. Don't plant trees and shrubs right up against your property. Right? Especially, especially hard up against say windows, because as we've said before, the window, the glass is, is a weak spot. Right? Also, know where the fire is likely to come from when you plan your garden. And as a general rule of thumb, and this doesn't happen every single time, but generally speaking, nine out of 10 times, whatever, 90% of the time, the biggest issue for us with fires are those coming out of the north and the northwest. So a fire that's burning coming down from Cockatoo, coming down from Jembrel, all right, coming straight down towards Pakanamapa or across the Narnagoon North. That's where our fires generally come from because they are being blown with that hot, strong, north, northwesterly wind that's coming from Central Australia. So those hot and those high risk days will have those conditions. So if you know that, okay, that's our north northern face, that's our the northwestern side, think about what you're going to plant. If you're in the in the, the um, stage of, of redesigning your garden, put the veggie garden, plant your orchard on those north northwestern sides because veggies tend to be green, fruit trees tend to be green during that summer period. Now they're going to burn, I accept that, but they will slow the spread of that fire. The other thing is you have a, a discontinue between the areas. You have some space and the lawn is cut or you're running a gravel, a gravel path. So the fire that comes through and, and it's on the lawn, it's burning the lawn, it hits that gravel path, it can't go any further unless it jumps or an ember jumps across. Right. So think about the plantings on the north and north uh, northwestern side. And as I said before, the CFA website, that landscaping for uh, for bushfire, you can download that book, um, has, has some wonderful tips and ideas. And then there's also um, <clears throat> another link to plantings, garden design for rural areas, for the hills gardens, coastal gardens, um, and, uh, and urban gardens. Okay. Thanks, Sam. Yep, you can find that time. The landscaping and design choices that you make for your gardens and backyards can significantly affect the bushfire risk to your home. So you need to make sure you're making the right decisions. There are three main reasons that houses burn down during fire. Embers landing on or near the house, which is the most common way houses catch fire. Radiant heat from burning vegetation near the house or direct flame contact.
start by creating defendable space. You should have an inner zone immediately around your house where you reduce, remove or rearrange vegetation. This can limit the impacts of radiant heat and direct flame contact. It would normally be about 10 metres out from the house. You should also have an outer zone where vegetation is managed to a more moderate level. Use driveways and paths to create separation between vegetation and the house. Trees and vegetation should not be located close to vulnerable parts of the building, such as windows, decks and eaves. Concrete or pave up to the edge of the house or replace flammable mulches such as tan bark with inorganic alternatives such as river pebbles or gravel. Keep grass cut to five centimetres within the inner zone and 10 centimetres within the outer zone. Locate shrubs away from trees. Shrubs and surface vegetation can act as a ladder fuel to carry fire up into the trees. To limit a fire's ability to spread, clump trees together so they don't form a continuous canopy and keep garden beds separated. Both can be achieved by clever placement of gravel paths or mown grass, elements in any good garden design. There are no fireproof trees or plants. All vegetation can burn under the right conditions. However, some are less flammable than others, so it's important to carefully select and properly maintain vegetation. Avoid trees with loose ribbon or stringy bark that could shower your house with embers during a fire. Locating trees a safe distance from the house will reduce the chance of limbs falling and damaging the structure. If this happens, embers could get inside and set fire to your home. Back at the house, you can strengthen the building against the risk of embers by sealing any gaps and making improvements to the structure. Seal around windows, doors and eaves to prevent embers lodging in any gaps and ensure painted surfaces aren't flaking. You can prevent leaf litter and embers getting under the deck and into the underfloor space by sealing any vents or gaps using a steel mesh. More expensive options, including sprinklers on the roof, can make a big difference to house survivability. Fire burns wherever there is fuel. If you reduce the fuel around your home, you can reduce how hot and destructive a fire is as it passes through your property. We have only touched on a few actions for you to consider. CFA has extensive information on designing your garden for bushfire. And don't forget the final part of preparing your property, a big clean up before summer and maintenance throughout the season. Thanks, Sam. Um, so, uh, so about clearing the vegetation, <coughs> pardon me, um, a lot of the municipal councils have a, a 1030 and a 1050 rule which enables residents to remove some of the vegetation. Now, it all depends on um, planning zones. Um, the, the best thing I can recommend is that you talk to uh, Stuart at the council or others at the, at the council who have that uh, expert knowledge in uh, the 1030 and the 1050 rule. Um, your property will need to be, obviously, there's a, the, the bushfire management overlay. Um, if you're building a new home, there are obviously going to be lots of, of regulations that you now need to abide by. But as far as the, the clearing of vegetation, you, there is a little bit of, of lee, leeway, a little bit of, if you've got a little bit of a say, you definitely have a say in what you plant. So think carefully about what you plant and where you plant it. That's important. As I said before, don't plant right up against the building because if a limb was to fall, it could compromise the structure or, <clears throat> pardon me, don't plant in front of, of uh, the windows because of the, the vulnerability of, of the glass um, breaking or whatever. So think about that. But check up on the 1030 rule, 1050 rule, talk to, to, to Stuart. Um, Stuart might be able to, at the end of this, give us a little bit of a, a quick summary about the, uh, the 1030 rule and 1050 rule, how it applies here in Cadenia. Um, thanks, Tam. Can you just click on the... Uh... Yeah. <clears throat>
What you doing? Getting ready for the fire season. Need any help? Just clear that scrub back and knock that tree down like you were going to. Right, yeah. Big job, that. Not so big. Paperwork, red tape. No paperwork, no red tape. Can't go clearing natural vegetation just like that, you know. Can? Up to 50 metres around the house in an area like ours. Oh, yeah? Who made you an expert? Google. Still, going to have to get council approval for this tree? No, we don't. 10.50. 10.50? We can clear trees and branches up to 10 metres from the house and other vegetation up to 50 metres. So, I can just get on with it? It's never been easier and more important to clear around your home. In most places, you can clear trees and branches up to 10 metres from the house and other vegetation up to 30, even 50 metres, depending on where you live. Just check your area on the CFA website. Great. Clear up or clear out. Thanks. As said, um, um, check, we'll get uh, Stuart to uh, give us a little bit of a rundown um, at the end of the, the presentation. It's only a couple more slides to go. So leading up to these uh, bad fire days, um, don't like leave everything to the last minute. So you can do some of the, the preparation well before a fire was to arrive or before a fire would even start. So think about, uh, have it as part of your plan to say, okay, on, on days where they're, it's rated um, extreme, we're, we're going to be leaving and we're going to be leaving at this term, no time. So we need to move some of our furniture off the deck or we need to, to do this, this and this. So it's a part of your written plan. Right? So on that severe day, you've already got that written plan. Okay. So, you know, when you, you sort of think, well, even um, well before the fire season, checking the gutters, because if the gutters are clean now, they're not going to always stay clean, but they're going to be easier to clean uh, subsequently from, from this time on. OK, thanks, Tam. Um, and then on those really um, bad days, do you want to go to the next slide, please, Tam? So on the, no, back one, sorry. <laughs> on those really high risk days now, those really bad days, right, those, as I said before, they're usually that hot, dry and windy, right? Uh, you could lose power. So think about what do I, what operates on, on, on electricity on the garage door? Do you know how to open it manually? Do other members in your family know how to open it uh, manually? Does everyone know how to operate the, the electric gate once the power is out the front of the driveway, once the power is gone? Right? Check that you've, you've moved all those things that can um, ignite so much so easily. Right? The mat, the outdoor furniture. Turn off the gas supply. If you've got time, block the downpipes. Right? And partially fill your gutters. Don't, don't fill them right up to the top. They just only need a layer of water in it. Right. Make sure that you close and you lock all the windows and the doors. Right. The other thing is, and it's really important, is to leave your front gate open. Because if you leave your front gate open, we can come in a lot easier. We don't have to stop, open the gate. If you've got a padlock on it, we have to you know, somehow gain access. So leave the gates open. That's obviously, if you've got large animals like horses and, and cattle, uh, and that driveway gate is in, into the paddock, well, then obviously quite keep the gate closed. But if it's not, if you've got a separate house yard, leave the, the, the gate open. Don't allow the, the animals to roam out onto the road. They will um, create problems for, um, for traffic out there. Okay. Thanks, Sam. Um, I think uh, we can go to the questions. I think if you click the next slide, 
Tam. There's um, if you've got any um, questions, like we finish up tonight, and you think, oh, I could have asked this question, or what was John talking about that landscaping booklet? What was the the the, uh, the link for it, or where can I find it? You can drop us a line at fire safety outreach at cfa.vic.gov.au. Send us an email, and we will most definitely get back to you. Uh, or you can phone the mobile number that we have dedicated to this type of, uh, of uh, work. Okay. Um, check just the CFA website. Uh, search property preparation. But there's all the sorts of things that you can do that you've got access to. That's important. John, sorry, can I just say the, the questions that I asked before where people resided from, uh, we've got some from Officer Beaconsfield, Pakenham, Narry, and they range from residential to five acres to 20 acres. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. So there's a good smatter smattering of people from the, the Hills area, basically, um, along that, the, the highway, which is uh, yeah, really pleasing. Um, and, and look, and whether it's a, a, a two hectare property or a, a quarter of a hectare, um, or a 20 hectare property, you've, you've got a house on it. You want to prepare your property, your home as best you can right, so that it can survive a little bit better. Uh -huh. Because ideally, and we've always said, leave and leave early. I can't give you a specific time, but don't leave it until you see smoke, really thick smoke or flames. That is far too late. All right. But have a plan. Have a written plan. Understand what the fire danger ratings are. All right. Use triggers. And maybe the fire danger rating will be one of your triggers. Also, download the Vic Emergency app. And with the Vic Emergency app, you can create um, zones around your, your property and around your, your uh, loved one's properties, right? Out to, so you're notified of any emergency in that five or 10 or 20 or 30 kilometer radius. So uh, I think uh, that's all I've got. I think we're, we're gonna go to a, a, a 